You should clean your wounds with rubbing alcohol. Ouch! Slap a choking person on the back. Yeah, not really working. After getting stabbed, take mm -hmm. out the sharp object from the body. This is from movies. Um, this is stupid, don't do this. <laughs> Hi, my name is Randy Lee, I'm a paramedic here in New York City and I've been working EMS for 11 years. Hi, my name is Lorena Concepcion Martinez. I am a paramedic here in New York City, also with Randy, for the past 19 years. And today we'll be debunking myths about first aid. Ready? Let's go. If someone gets a concussion, keep them awake. This is an old wives' tale. They associated someone having a concussion and going into a coma and not being able to wake up. So that's why they used to say to keep everybody awake. Now, we have figured out that the sleeping does not cause the coma. When someone has a concussion, it is considered a type of TBI, a traumatic brain injury. You do wanna monitor them though. You wanna make sure there's no deficit, no changes. So things you're gonna be looking out for would be slurred speech, vomiting, uh, unsteady gait, which means you're like wobbly when you walk. A little dizzy. Yeah, you don't want any of that. So if you think that's a problem and it's not self-resolving, then yeah, take them to the hospital, let them do a CAT scan, let them make sure that the patient's not having an internal bleed in their brain. You should put something into the mouth of someone having a seizure. Negative. This is a major no-no. This is another old wives tale of people thinking that the patient having the seizure was gonna swallow their tongue. It's more muscle spasms and clenching of the jaws so you don't really have to worry about the patient swallowing the tongue or anything along those lines. That whole time you are talking, I tried to swallow my tongue, I couldn't do it. <laughs> so it's not true. When someone's having a seizure, they're having these uh, fasciculations, this tightening of the muscles. What'll happen is they'll clench to their jaw. And if you put something in their mouth, they'll break their teeth, they'll break their jaw. Bite your finger off. Yeah, don't do it. You also want to let the seizure pass. You want to make sure once they've stopped, you can roll them on their side and just kind of be supportive until EMS arrives to help. Most seizures will resolve themselves after, say, 30 seconds to a minute. but. Uh, if you have something called status epilepticus. The patient will end up having continuous seizures, which will affect their breathing. That point is where you need the advanced medical care, advanced life support, paramedics like Randy and I, to come in and give medications to actually try to subside the seizures and transport the patient to the hospital as quickly as possible. Slap a choking person on the back. This myth does come from how you treat an infant or a child that is choking, because we do back slaps, as we call them, in an infant or a child. But in adult, you want to emphasize on doing the Heimlich maneuver. Wait, hold on, I have a thing for this. So, imagine this guy's choking. We're gonna try the back slap thing. Yeah, not really working. If you come across a person choking, try to encourage them to keep coughing. So Randy here is gonna show you the universal choking sign, which is? Uh, this they is won't be smiling, clearly, but <laughs> you know, maybe like this. That's the universal choking sign. Do not, I stress do not give them anything to drink. You want them to yeah. keep coughing until they clear that airway. And if it becomes completely obstructed that they can't get any air movement, they can't speak, and they start turning blue, it's time for that Heimlich and definitely 911. Depending on who you follow, the protocol for treating choking is a little bit different. The American Red Cross recommends five back blows followed by five abdominal thrusts and repeat. But Lorena and I follow the American Heart Association protocols, so we go straight to the abdominal thrusts. When you're doing the abdominal thrust, like the old name of the Heimlich maneuver, you're gonna make a fist. So this goes right to the navel, just slightly above. You're gonna do a pulling up motion, like a J. And you're gonna squeeze with a lot of force. So unlike the movies and stuff, this actually takes a lot of effort. You can't just do it in one shot. You're gonna be really tired doing this and it's probably gonna hurt the person as well, but it's better than them choking to death. Oh, good. There you go. When you do this, please make sure to keep your head to the side, because if not, the patient will bang you on your nose and you might end up with a bloody nose. Boom. Always suck the venom out of a snake bite. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer this properly. It's ill-advised to ever have an answer in your life where sucking something out is like your go-to thing. If you drop food coloring into a cup of water, right. it's very difficult to get it back 
together. It's impossible to yeah. get it all out. So the same applies for venom on a snake bite. Once it's in, it's in the bloodstream, it's gonna circulate. So it's really not gonna do much. The other thing is stay away from putting any kind of tourniquet. It's gonna create more damage than what it's gonna help. If someone's gonna be bit by a venomous snake, sucking on the wound, you're gonna get such a minimal amount out that it's not gonna do anything and then you leave them exposed to infection because your mouth is probably dirty. If you encounter someone who's had a venomous, keyword venomous, snake bite, you definitely wanna call 911 as soon as possible and get that patient to the hospital. You wanna go to a venom center or a bite center. And it's yeah. particularly a hospital that has all kinds of anti-venoms, antidotes for this kind of incident. CPR requires mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. CPR does not require mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. There are procedures of just doing chest compressions that allow you to make sure that blood circulating through the whole body to get oxygenated blood to the brain. That's the goal. It buys you time for us paramedics to show up. A couple years back, CPR was required mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, but do you really want to put your mouth on a total complete stranger? The American Heart Association and everyone else who teaches CPR have been doing a strong emphasis on hands only. It eliminates the transmission of any communicable diseases or anything along those lines. To do CPR properly, you're gonna to wanna to expose the chest down so you have access to the bare chest. Palm your hand, it's under the chest. You're gonna wrap your fingers around each other and then you're just gonna push straight down. For an adult, it's about two inches or so, but basically just gonna keep that going on for 100 beats per minute. There is a song that we utilize all the time. Historically, we use Stayin' Alive. Ah, 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 stayin' alive, stayin' alive. So when you're doing CPR, the main thing you wanna just maintain is that those compressions are gonna be consistent. Anytime you stop, that threshold goes down. It causes a huge amount of detriments to the body. You gotta start doing it immediately. You got like six minutes before you have irreversible damage to the brain, so. Start CPR quick, give them a good shot. After getting stabbed, take mm -hmm. out the sharp object from the body. This is from movies. Um, this is stupid, don't do this. Do not remove it. You will cause a lot more tissue damage yeah. and cause a lot more bleeding. So please, I stress this, please do not remove it. What? Leave it in place. You should stabilize it so it doesn't go wiggling around inside because any kind of movement to the foreign object It'll create more damage. It's great in movies though. It's hysterical. Drama effect. It's just like, oh! why? No. I don't get it. Yeah. You have to be medically trained to use a defibrillator. It'll make you feel more confident, but you really don't. What you see out there, they're not actually defibrillators like you see in the movies. Paddles and all that craziness, they don't do well, that. Well, let's show them. Okay, so this is an AED. This is an automatic external defibrillator. A defibrillator basically shocks the heart. All municipal buildings have these in every location. So the best thing about defibrillators is that anyone can use them. All you have to do is open it up and press the power button and it will literally tell you step by step what needs to be done. Open it up. Adult mode. Remove all clothing from patient's chest. Can you pull the red handle? Sure. And Doink. pictures on pads. There are photos to show you exactly where you're supposed to put these things on. You want to use this as quickly as possible once you know the person is in cardiac arrest. If the person is unresponsive but you're not sure, you still want to use this and put it on the patient's chest. If the patient's alive, it will tell you not to shock. Analyzing heart rhythm. Provide chest compressions to the beat. And continue CPR. Don't be afraid to ask someone to go get the defibrillator or the AEZ. Put butter on a burn to heal it. What are you, a piece of toast? <laughs> that would be a no. You do not put butter on a burn. It's gonna trap the heat. And ultimately, the heat is gonna keep radiating, so it will continue to burn. Basically, you wanna stop the burning process, no matter what it is. It could be a first degree burn to a third degree burn. You wanna just eliminate that, right? So just cool water. Keyword cool, not cold. You just wanna keep it clean, sterile, and cool it down. Seek medical care. If you get frostbite on your hands, rub them together to warm them up. Ooh. 
I would say you don't want to do that. We went from hot to cold. Yeah, we did go from hot to cold. If you do have frostbite on your fingertips or toes, which is usually where it starts, you never want to rub them. The friction will cause more damage to the skin tissue and the cells below it. So you want to warm them up slowly, coming into a warmer environment, taking off any wet clothing on it, mm. and just gradually warming it up. So how do you know the difference, though, between just being cold and having frostbite. You'll have this waxy type deal on your hands. Your hands are gonna be a little more puffy. Basically, you're gonna be blistered up. Imagine like just a really bad burn, except the opposite, because it's cold. Once you cross that frostbite threshold, it's something that you definitely need to go to the emergency room to be treated by a physician, because the amount of damage that can be done by treating it incorrectly can be irreversible. You should clean your wounds with rubbing alcohol. Ouch! Um, I'm sorry, this is painful just to think about it. And that would be a no. Rubbing alcohol is gonna be very painful. So please stay away from rubbing alcohol. Just a simple soap and water. If you have antibacterial soap, even better. It cleans it, sure, but why go through the trouble of like actually hurting yourself, essentially? You also wanna make sure that the wound stays moist and alcohol has this drying property that's not gonna be conducive to healing anyway. Keep it simple. Soap and water, if it's an abrasion, a simple cut, a day or two with a Band-Aid is always good just to control whatever bleeding you have. That's the main key. You wanna do the triple antibiotic and let it get free air. The air will actually help stimulate scabbing, and scabbing is a natural barrier that the body creates so mm -hmm. it can heal and regenerate. Wow, cardiac arrest and a heart attack are the same thing. They're not the same thing. Cardiac okay. arrest means that your heart stopped. They are no longer conscious, they are no longer breathing, and their heart is no longer beating. So this is where CPR comes into play. Heart attack, you have an occlusion in your heart. The heart is starving for air, causing the chest pain. You have the ability to get to the hospital. You'll have shortness of breath. You'll be diaphoretic, which means really, really sweaty. All classic signs of a heart attack. Not everyone will have the same symptoms. So remember, call 911 for either one. If you witness a drug overdose, put the person in the shower or bath. Um, no. Because one, you have no idea what the person overdosed on. Any kind of dramatic change to someone's temperature will throw the hemostasis of the body all out of whack. What does that mean? Your body has a regulation of temperature. You can't go into any extremes quickly. Yeah, it just makes getting the patient out and treated a lot more difficult yeah. if they're like in a bathtub and wet. And we as paramedics carry stuff such as Narcan to help counteract Yes. any narcotic overdoses. Specifically for opioid overdoses. But we also have other drugs that help with other types of overdoses. So please make sure, don't lie yeah, about what you took. That makes it way harder for us because if you took drug A and you tell us it was drug B, we're gonna go the wrong route and the treatment will get skewed and then we'll figure it out eventually, but then we have to backtrack and then go that route. It's, it's very dangerous. So no shower, this is debunked. Look at all these myths. The intention is there. Uh, everyone wants to help somebody else. That's great. But you're going to want to get a little education on your back end. Take a first aid class. You don't have to go to a level of EMT and paramedic. And who knows? You might be somebody's hero one day.